Popol Wu was actually the band of uh, Florian Fricke. And he was uh, not a close friend of mine, but uh, he was a friend already. And he lived outside of Munich in this little village, uh, Miesbach. And I got to know him through Eberhard Schöner, which is, uh, a, was a classical conductor and a classical trained musician, which uh, became as well an electronic musician. And their houses uh, in the countryside in this village have been maybe five minutes from each other. And it was 69 when I uh, uh, again visited uh, Eberhard Schöner in, in Miesbach. We, we very often met there at the weekends. Um, and the bus uh, I took broke down, though I had to walk up this hill. Miesbach is up on a hill, yeah? Beautiful Bavarian landscape. And I heard these strange sounds so strange. I heard a lot of this experimental music on tapes. Uh, Eberhard as well as Florian Fricke with Popol Wu tried and he did all this with flutes and acoustically things. And, but this was different. It was, I never heard a sound like this. I never heard sounds like this. It was like, well, somewhere out of space from the moon. From, uh, uh, I couldn't figure out what it was, and it was a bit spooky as well. And uh, uh, I walked toward the house of Florian Fricke, and it became louder and louder, and suddenly uh, uh -huh. I knocked at the door, and uh, his wife uh, opened, and she said, Psh, he has a new instrument. I said, oh, what is that called? Moog. I said, Moog? It's a synthesizer. And this was uh, in the house of Florian. Uh, he had a shack behind the house filled with this MOOC synthesizer because the first MOOC synthesizer was this big, like a house, yeah? And all these cables and all these strange uh, knobs and, and, and it was standing there. Uh, it, it, it was like really, uh, I saw a saucer from, from Mars or so something like that. He did the sounds with that. I liked Florian Frick. I met him in, in he lived near Munich. He had his first MOOC synthesizer, this, this, this big thing. Oh, he was, he was part of the scene, but away, away from it as well. At the same time, I think. It, he, he behaved like this as well, I think. He didn't like too much people around himself. And he was a really mystic, mystic people. He was wealthy enough to be able to buy a Moog synthesizer in 1969. I mean, a Moog synthesizer then would have cost a lot of money. And he basically w would have come in, in various modules being sent from, from America, and he would have to put it together. So the cost of all this. And he had 64 keys, his one, and he spent a lot of time working on it. Remember that with a Moog, each key has to be tuned. Sep if you want to make a sound, you have to tune each key. It's a very laborious process. There's an awful lot of wiring to be done. I think he had this Moog synthesizer and they used it, you know, to get, to get recognition and to get... Um, but remember, the, the synthesizer was a key to the German scene. They, they really seized on, you know, driven by Stockhausen and all the other people, they seized on instruments in a way that, you know, other cultures didn't seize on them. I mean, in America, you had records coming out like Wendy Carlos, and Morton Subotny, which were driven by commercial. The less mess making, let's make it literal, it's commercial. So you had Wendy Carlos playing back on, which was an enormous feat to do on, on, a, on an early Moog, a, a prototype Moog. But the Germans weren't interested in that. I mean, they could, that's boring to them. They want to play German composers, old fashioned. They wanted to play new sounds, new, make new music. And this is the difference, I think, between the two cultures. The 
elektronische Musik ist eine Musik ohne Tradition. Die Sachen, die da gemacht wurden, waren in den 60ern nur einem sehr kleinen Publikum bekannt. Äh, man denkt so Stockhausen, das wäre so der Übervater äh, oder Leute wie Pierre Schäffer. Es waren Namen, die, die nur sehr wenige Leute kannten. Äh, oder die frühen Experimente mit Elektronik von Leuten wie Luigi Nono. Äh, das war ein, 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 eine so, so hochkultur avantgarde insider gruppe die das kannte. Für den 16- oder 18-jährigen Jugendlichen lief der Zugang zur elektronischen Musik völlig anders. Die Tradition, die es da gab, war die des Science-Fiction-Films. Es ist eben nicht nur das, dass diese, diese Filmmusiken plötzlich was völlig Neues waren. Äh, dieses Filmgenre erfreute sich ja zu dieser Zeit großer Beliebtheit. Und mehr noch als das Film, die Filme, äh, die entsprechende Literatur. Las der junge Arbeiter Science-Fiction-Romane und träumte von einer anderen und hoffentlich besseren Welt. Und der Soundtrack dazu... Nachdem man diese Filme gesehen hatte, wie, wie Forbidden Planet, wusste man auch, wie diese Zukunft klingen muss. Der Blick ging in die Zukunft und man wählte sich eine Musik, die klanglich einfach komplett nicht von nicht, nicht nur nicht aus diesem Land, sondern auch nicht aus dieser Welt ist. Und dazu kam, dass im selben Moment, wo das Bedürfnis dazu da war, auch die technischen Mittel dafür entstanden waren. kamen halt genau diese Mittel der Klanggestaltung, die etwas mit Raum zu tun haben. Nachhall, Echo, also alles, was künstliche Räume kreiert, deren Klang einem sofort sah, hier sind wir woanders. And it was within this climate of a developing electronic music scene that Kraftwerk appeared. Having been dropped from their label after the failure of the organization record, Ralph Hutter and Florian Schneider regrouped and renamed their outfit. Literally translated as Power Plant, Kraftwerk were one of the few groups within the scene that had chosen a German name, and it perfectly summed up their aesthetic goals. A major city situated in the heart of Germany's main industrial area, Dusseldorf itself provided a key influence for Hutter and Schneider. Since the war, the area had been developed and renovated, and this progressive, modern industrial world would be reflected in Kraftwerk's music. Featuring the twin drumming of Andreas Hohmann and future Neu member Klaus Dinger, Kraftwerk once again called on Connie Plank to record their self-titled debut in August 1970, assisted by engineer Klaus Lohmer. Connie had us all presented, and then we actually experimented. Keiner wusste eigentlich genau, was machen wir eigentlich da. Da haben die ja so ein Schlagzeug aufgebaut, das war aber so ein Kinderschlagzeug, wo die dann gespielt haben. Wir haben Soundcheck gemacht und rumprobiert. Und eines Tages war auch mal eine Grille im Studio, das war ein Riesenstudio. Und dann haben wir so einen großen Galgen da hochgefahren, haben dann einen Song, ich weiß nicht, ob der auf der CD drauf ist oder auf dem Album, einen Song mit einer Grille gemacht. Die war aber live im Studio. Ne? Und das war eigentlich immer toll. Man hat immer rumprobiert, war natürlich auch ein bisschen so... Manchmal im Rausch, das gehörte dazu damals. Ne? Und so ist das alles entstanden. Der ist offen für alles. Der hat auch hier die, die Blackfills produziert, also eine Kölner Gruppe, die Karneval zusammen machen. Gianna Nanini kam hier hin. Der war einfach ein Typ, der konnte auf die Menschen zugehen, konnte das rauskitzeln, was derjenige hat. Ne? Da war ein Fachmann drin. Ne? 
und eben die Ruhe selbst, wenn dann einer nicht, das nicht so konnte, das war ganz in Ruhe, ganz relaxed, nochmal und nochmal und dann machen wir das noch. Der hat sich wirklich viel, viel Mühe gegeben. Ne? Die konnten schon ganz gut spielen, aber sie haben eigentlich immer nur probiert, so, so habe ich das in Erinnerung, ist ja schon etwas länger her. Ne? Technisch gut spielen konnten sie eigentlich nicht, aber sie hatten eben tolle Ideen und mit dem wenigen, kann man vergleichen mit dem Gitarrist von Prokel Harum, der hatte eigentlich nichts drauf, aber die paar Töne, die er gespielt hat, die saßen, das war bei denen genauso. Ne? Kraftwerk's self-titled debut was issued in late 1970 on the Philips label, only months after the release of Tone Float. With both accessible and highly experimental material contained across its four tracks, it went on to sell 60,000 copies in Germany. It was distinguished by the use of the flute. I mean, the flute as, uh, and then and, and very light keyboards and, and this lovely pattern of percussion that they were generating from the bass keys of the keyboard. And there was a lightness to it that was, and there was a, a clarity to it that was very different. They were going for a much more minimalistic sound. It wasn't a huge band improvising in the studio. It wasn't loud and noisy and hitting him over the head. It was basically um, uh, sounds and um, music that was very well organized. <laughs> Ich finde ich das immer noch toll. Ne? Also bei dem Ruckzuck, wo wir das aufgenommen haben, also da waren wir selber so begeistert, dass wir das immer wieder hören mussten und immer dran gearbeitet haben. Da wusste man, das ist es. Das spürt man dann. Ne? Es gibt so im Studio verschiedene Situationen, wenn auf einmal man das immer wieder hören will, was man da aufgenommen hat, dann ist da irgendwas dran. Ne? Ruckzuck was a track that was solidly based on building rhythms and putting them together in a way that you know would become memorable and danceable to I should imagine so they were interested in compressing their sound in a way and uh, creating a rhythmic uh, stride to it that would um, appeal I should imagine they were trying to be appealing as well as you know revolutionary the thing about Crawford uh, one is that it ends with this this track uh, von Himmelhock are coming down from the heavens and it just sounds like falling bombs coming down on top of you and exploding and that would be very pertinent to the German experience. The difference between Kraftwerk and the other bands and the other bands wish to totally disassociate themselves from the past of the German, the German's history and they also wish to actually make a, a totally new using the hippie ideal of freeform improvisation but Kraftwerk were different, they were willing to embrace the past and in, in so doing, they actually, in the long term, they invented a new kind of aesthetic that, that, that people around the world could really relate to by using humor and experiment and brilliant understanding of electronic sound. They've made their own, they, made, they re, basically remade German identity and made it something to actually look at. And you can feel it in, in, on Crawford 1, they're actually willing to embrace the fact that a lot of bombs re, were both dropped on and by Germany. And this is the experience that, let's say, Stockhausen had gone through firsthand, being a stretcher bearer in the Second World War. He, a lot of bombs were dropped on him, he escaped. Um, and so this was a very brave thing to do in some ways. And uh, it, was, it was obviously going, going to, they weren't going to shun the past. I missed the organization record and I think <laughs> whole Germany missed it because it was not released here. So it started really with the first craft work here. Yeah. Um, well again, people made jokes and said, mm. it's like, well, are they uh, with the tape in a noisy house, uh, what do they do? Yeah, this is not music. This is maybe it's experimental music. Yes, we can accept that. 
but it has nothing to do with the underground scene, with the alternative scene, with the rock scene. It's um, okay, it might be interesting, but it, it, it is something for a very limited audience. Yeah, for the art people or something.